When we picture the next catastrophic earthquake, most minds jump to the San Andreas, the Cascadia subduction zone, or Alaska's restless coast. What if the next truly large rupture is not out west off the coast or up in the Alaska range, but right beneath a mountain front that rises above a growing metropolis? Could a major earthquake strike under Salt Lake City with consequences nobody's expecting? If the rocks beneath your feet are quietly stretching and tilting, how soon could they let go, and how violent might that motion be? Beneath Salt Lake City and the cities that line the Wasatch Front lies a long, active fault system that has shaped the landscape for millions of years. The Wasatch Fault runs roughly 240 miles, 390 kilometers, from central Utah into southern Idaho. It marks the abrupt eastern edge of the Basin and Range province, a vast region where the crust is being pulled apart. That pulling has a simple geometric outcome. The crust breaks into blocks that tilt and move, producing mountain ranges on one side and down-dropped valleys on the other. The Wasatch Range sits on the uplifted block. Salt Lake Valley occupies the hanging wall that has dropped down. That tectonic geometry is the fundamental reason the fault matters. The cities of the valley sit directly over the down-drop block, which is exactly where shaking and ground deformation are amplified. The Wasatch Fault is a normal fault. In straightforward terms, that means the hanging wall moves downward relative to the foot wall under regional extension. Yet normal should not be mistaken for mild. Normal faults can store and release enormous strain and the Wasatch Fault shows a long history of large ruptures. Paleoseismic studies, trenching across scarps, dating sediments, and counting past surface ruptures reveal at least 26 major events with magnitude estimates on the order of 6.5 or larger during the last 6,000 years on some parts of the fault. Those events have left visible scarps, offset terraces, and faulted lake deposits that geologists can read like pages in a book. The pattern is episodic. Some segments slip more frequently, others remain quiet for long stretches, and then break in a big event. Geologists break the Wasatch Fault into about ten segments, and each segment has its own rhythm. The central segments near the Salt Lake Valley, including those beneath Ogden, Salt Lake City proper, and points south toward Nephi, are among the most studied because they lie under dense populations and because their geologic records show repeated surface rupturing earthquakes. Based on dating of past surface ruptures, many segments show recurrence intervals on the order of 300 to 400 years though there is wide variability. Some segments have gone much longer than their average between large events. Others have been relatively active. Crucially, averages do not equal calendars. Averages tell us the system is capable of producing large events repeatedly through time, but they do not pinpoint the day a rupture will occur. One aspect of the Wasatch Fault that alters how earthquakes play out is the way the fault behaves with depth. At the surface, the fault may appear steeply dipping, especially near the mountain front, but geophysical imaging shows the plane often flattens somewhat at depth. That change in geometry matters. A flatter dip at depth increases the area of fault that can slip during a rupture and a larger slipping area generally produces a larger earthquake. Laboratory studies on fault rocks sampled from Wasatch exposures reveal that the crushed, altered minerals that make up the fault core are mechanically weak and slippery. When rock has been ground into a fine, clay-rich gouge through many past earthquakes, the frictional resistance drops. Low friction allows a fault to rupture more easily and to propagate ruptures over longer distances at depth. 
In the case of the Wasatch Fault, this combination of a bedding that flattens and slick fault gouge helps explain why ruptures can become large, even where surface geometry suggests limited motion. We cannot talk about shaking in Salt Lake Valley without discussing the basin itself. Much of the urban corridor sits on sediments left behind by ancient Lake Bonneville. Over tens of thousands of years, clays, silts, sands and gravels accumulated to create a thick, soft fill across the valley floor. These soft, water-saturated sediments act like a drumhead during shaking. Seismic waves entering the basin slow and amplify. Waves can reverberate and become trapped, building larger motions at the surface than would occur on bedrock. The thickness of these basin deposits varies across the valley, and where they are deepest, the amplification is strongest. Recent seismic imaging and borehole studies have demonstrated that basin depths and sediment softness are greater in some areas than previously thought, which increases the potential for dangerous amplification in those neighbourhoods. Liquefaction is a related but distinct hazard tied to these valley sediments. During intense shaking, saturated sands and silts can temporarily lose strength and behave like a viscous fluid. Foundations can settle or tilt, buried pipelines can float or break, and roads and levees can slump. Liquefaction does not require a nearby fault rupture. Strong shaking from a distant source can trigger it if the local sediments are prone to it. Historical events and modelling studies indicate that large portions of the Salt Lake Valley are susceptible to liquefaction if shaking reaches high intensities. That means the location of soft sediment layers and their groundwater content is a major control on how widely and severely damage will develop in a large earthquake. Another crucial concept is the segmentation of the fault and the possibility of multi-segment ruptures. Each of the ten segments can break independently in a moderate to large earthquake, but sometimes ruptures jump from one segment to the next. When multiple adjacent segments rupture in one event, the faulting area multiplies and the resulting earthquake can reach higher magnitudes. Geological trenches and surface mapping show both single-segment and multi-segment events in the Wasatch past. The probability that a rupture will jump segments depends on factors such as stress transfer from prior earthquakes, the presence of structural complexities between segments, and the state of strain accumulation along the fault. Modelling studies that simulate rupture dynamics suggest that while single-segment events are common, cascading ruptures across several segments cannot be ruled out and would produce the largest and most damaging earthquakes. Seismicity patterns and modern earthquake sequences also offer clues about the fault's behaviour. The spring of 2020 produced a shallow earthquake near Magna, just west of Salt Lake City, that measured about 5.7 in magnitude. That sequence produced thousands of aftershocks and reminded scientists and the public that active faults near the valley can and do rupture today. Smaller earthquakes release some of the built-up strain, but do not necessarily prevent a larger event. In tectonic regions, strain accumulates over centuries and millennia. Single moderate events are sometimes a prelude to later larger ruptures, and sometimes they are isolated blips. Understanding which is the case requires detailed monitoring of stress changes, aftershock distributions, and long-term deformation measured with GPS and seismic networks. Geodetic measurements add another layer of insight. GPS stations and other deformation sensors across Utah show that the Basin and Range province continues to extend, albeit slowly. The extension rates are measured in millimetres per year, but over geological time, 
those small rates lead to significant strain accumulation on major faults. Interpreting these slow, steady motions alongside the paleoseismic record allows scientists to estimate how much elastic strain has built up and how much energy could be released in a future rupture. When paleoseismic evidence indicates a segment has gone longer than its typical recurrence interval, geologists often describe that segment as having elevated hazard simply because more strain may have accumulated on it. Imaging studies, including active source seismics and dense arrays of passive sensors, have recently improved our view of the subsurface under the Wasatch Front. These surveys have sharpened estimates of sediment thickness, mapped the depth and dip of the fault at depth, and revealed structural complexities such as splays and secondary faults that crisscross the region. The three-dimensional models that come from these data are essential. They feed into ground motion simulations that predict how different parts of the valley will shake in various earthquake scenarios. Those simulations show complex patterns of amplification and show that shaking intensity does not decrease smoothly with distance. Instead, local basin geometry, sediment layers and fault rupture directivity produce pockets of especially strong motion. Another important geological factor is the nature of the rupture itself. Ruptures can be shallow or deep, slow or fast, and they can direct seismic energy preferentially in one direction. If a rupture propagates toward a city and the fault geometry and rupture velocity align, seismic waves can be focused, producing stronger shaking in certain areas. Rupture directivity is a phenomenon well documented in past earthquakes around the world, and it is a consideration in Wasatch scenarios. Conversely, a rupture that directs most of its energy away from the valley will have different impacts. Predicting directivity for a given earthquake is not possible in advance, but understanding its potential helps scientists build a spectrum of realistic scenarios. Taken together, the geological picture of the Wasatch Fault is one of an active, complex system capable of producing large earthquakes. The long paleoseismic record of repeated surface rupturing events, the low friction materials within the fault core, the basin, amplification and liquefaction potential under the valley, the possibility of multi-segment ruptures and the ongoing crustal extension all point toward a meaningful seismic threat. Scientific efforts continue to refine the details. Researchers trench the ground to extend the paleo record, image the subsurface in ever finer detail, run physics-based rupture models, and improve ground motion predictions. For those who study faults and shaking, the Wasatch system is not a hypothetical curiosity. It is a real, measurable hazard with clear geological drivers. The question is not whether the rocks will move again, they will, but when, where, and how violently. The science cannot schedule earthquakes, only describe the processes that make them possible and narrow the range of plausible outcomes. What the geological evidence makes unambiguous is that the Wasatch Fault is a major seat of tectonic energy in the interior western United States, and that its mechanisms, extension of the crust, fault geometry, weak fault materials, basin amplification, and potential for segmented ruptures combine in ways that can produce very large damaging earthquakes. Understanding those processes is the essential first step toward meaningful scientific forecasts and realistic scenarios of what the next large quake in Utah could look like. If this breakdown helped you understand the real science behind Utah's earthquake risk, don't let it stop here. Hit like, share this video with anyone who lives along the Wasatch Front, and subscribe for more deep, no-nonsense science coverage. And don't forget to tap that hype icon.
It tells the algorithm this matters and helps this video reach a much wider audience. Your support keeps this kind of content coming.